Well, it is one of the most important and sacred days in a person's life. A day where every detail is curated and every minute is planned out. It's a day when hopes and dreams are fulfilled. It is the what? The wedding day. A beautiful day, a happy day, a day that we all hope exceeds the expectations of the couple and the families and the guests. But we all know it doesn't always go that way, does it? (laughs) Plans don't always unfold and wedding mishaps or blunders or disruptions enter the picture. And that's been true at fellowships, weddings over the years. In one of my weddings, I looked right at the bride and I said, do you take this man to be your wife? (laughs) She looked at me and she said, no, no. (laughs) Try again. One of our uh, original pastors, Gary Harrell, was doing a wedding up in Bentonville on Walton Boulevard at the Peel Mansion, which is located between the home office and a super center. And right in the middle of the wedding, a turbojet helicopter showed up and began to hover over the super center, delivering an HVAC unit to the rooftop. It was an outdoor wedding, and they couldn't hear a thing, and the wind was swirling. You never know what's going to happen. One of our couples had an outdoor ceremony, and the culminating point was they were going to uh, send one of those sky lanterns into the sky. You know what I'm talking about with the candle? Unfortunately, it faltered at takeoff, caught fire on the altar, and their first official act of marriage was stomping out a fire together. (laughs) I did a wedding on a farm, which is not uncommon here in Northwest Arkansas if you're new. We don't get married in churches. We get married in barns. And so... (laughs) We had the setting, it was perfect, and there was a fence right behind the altar, and as the guests arrived, so did the cows. They thought they were going to get fed, and behind me were these cows, and everybody thought it was cute until during the vows, they started to moo. And I would say, do you take (laughs) Classic, classic Northwest Arkansas. Our founding pastor, Robert Cup, did a wedding, and in this wedding, he was wearing a tux, but his fly was undone. And and it wasn't just his fly was undone. Somehow his shirt began to protrude from said unzipped fly. And so Robert did the old fig leaf, the whole wedding, (laughs) in front of the crowd. Classic Robert. Um, One of our pastors did his first wedding back in his youth ministry days. And, And back in the day, fellowship pastors sometimes would wear suits, sometimes a tux, and sometimes a liturgical robe. And he chose to wear the liturgical robe because he didn't own a suit. And so when he got there, he realized he never thought about what to wear under the robe. And you're supposed to wear a shirt and tie. But Brian Pope decided just to go shirtless. (laughs) Classic Pope. Today, our passage will actually feature a potential wedding mishap. I want you to open your Bibles to the Gospel of John. This is the fourth book in your New Testament, and we'll be in chapter two today, and here's what we're gonna see. Jesus is attending a wedding, and there is a potential wedding blunder, and he's actually going to use that potential wedding blunder to actually reveal the glory of God. We're continuing in our spring series, studying the Gospel of John. We're in week eight of a 21-week study of this New Testament narrative focused on Jesus. Our approach is in three sections of seven. So we have finished section one where we studied the seven I am statements in the gospel. Today we begin section two. We're gonna study the seven signs or the seven miracles of the gospel of John. And we'll get into later this summer into seven life-changing encounters that Jesus had with people that are recorded in the book. We do have a companion study guide, so if you're new to fellowship in just the last few weeks, uh, we'd love for you to pick one of these up. They're available out in the foyer. We have just a few left. In them, you'll find a Bible study. You'll find some devotional passages. You'll find a place to take notes, and you can grab one of those on your way out. Let's jump back into our study. Section two, the miracles or signs of John. Dr. Charles Ryrie said this. He said, if Jesus of Nazareth was who he claimed to be, then we should expect that he performed miracles. 
To believe in Jesus is to believe in the miraculous. The Bible records 35 specific signs that resulted from the hand or the voice of Jesus. And you can add to that the resurrection. Christianity is a supernatural faith. You cannot turn the page of the Gospels, which record for us the story of Christ's life and ministry without seeing a miracle emerge from the text. The life of Christ began with a miracle, virgin birth. It ended with a miracle or a sign, the resurrection. And there's still a supernatural sign to come. The physical bodily return of Jesus to this earth someday in the future. So what is a miracle? Let's consider these thoughts. A miracle is a supernatural manifestation of divine power. C.S. Lewis said that a miracle is an interference with nature by a supernatural power. In the occurrence of a miracle, the natural order is disrupted. Physical laws are broken. Divine intervention occurs. The unexplainable happens. And it happens in various arenas of life, like meteorology or healthcare or horticulture, or gastronomy, or physics. And these mighty works are spread across various groups of people, children and adults, men and women, both the religious and the irreligious, people of influence and people who've been marginalized. And in the miracles, Jesus exhibited power, power over nature, power over demons, power over sickness, the power of multiplication, even power over death. The miracles record for us stories of a higher hand intervening in the natural order to enact the sovereign will of God. And these signs and wonders are spread out over various places. They occurred at weddings, like we'll see today, or funerals, in the city and in the country, on land and at sea, in homes and in public spaces. And they produced in their witnesses astonishment and awe. And wonder. So a miracle, it's a supernatural uh, manifestation of divine power. It's also a unusual or significant event that authenticates a message or a, a messenger. Uh, Tim Keller said this, his miracles are not just proofs of his power, but they're wonderful foretaste of what he's going to do with his power. Jesus' miracles are not just a challenge to our minds, but a promise to our hearts that the world we all want is coming. C.S. Lewis said that a miracle by very definition is an exception. It's a unique intervention of the divine into earthly affairs. And the miracles have a purpose that extends beyond the immediate situation. They are designed to authenticate or validate Jesus as Messiah. The miracles put the power of heaven on full display here on earth. They are intended to incite belief in those who witness by sight or by word. And John calls them signs. There, there are three to four Greek words which describe a miracle in the New Testament. The most often used in John is the word simeon, translated into English for us as sign. John uses it 17 times to refer to the seven miracles that he shares in his gospel. The idea here is the miracles exist not without purpose or missional value, but they're designed to show us who Jesus is. They're signs of the Savior. The miracles are designed to arrest the attention of men. They're a signal flare to humanity, a revelation. They testify. They evidence the presence of the divine. They are signs pointing to something beyond themselves. So miracles, supernatural manifestation of divine power. They are also used to authenticate Jesus as God's messenger, but they also intersected the lives of everyday people. They are special intervention by God on behalf of his people. Miracles are not random events. They are uh, related to everyday life. They intersect the mess and the pain and the fear of everyday people in this world. In the miracles, Jesus brought relief. He brought resolution to problems and difficulties that he saw happening in people's lives. So, so you put it all together, they're both an agent of authentic authentication, but also of life change. When Jesus performed miracles, he altered life here on earth by exerting his divine power. And in doing so, he changed the lives of those around him and provided evidence or proof that he is the savior. Dr. Wayne Grudem, one of my favorite theologians, said this about miracles. A miracle is a less common kind of God's activity. 
in which he arouses people's awe and wonder and bears witness to himself. You could summarize the work of the miracles with this image. The miracles of Jesus alleviate. In the miracles, God supernaturally intervened in the lives of people to aid them in their need. He healed the sick. He calmed the storms. He multiplied the fish and the loaves, and as we'll see today in our story, even wine. He cast out demonic forces, and he, he validated in the miracles Jesus was authenticated as being divine. He was validated as the Messiah, the Savior, the one who was sent from heaven, God made flesh. And in the miracles, he cultivated in witnessing the miracles, the hearts of people were filled with awe and wonder and reverence and fear, which often led to belief. These unique events convinced people that he really must be who he claimed to be. So let me ask you, what would God have to do to convince you that he was real? We're going to hit you with it for seven weeks the divine power of God put on display here on earth. You know, some people might struggle with the miracles. Maybe that's you. The idea of supernatural influence pushes you outside of your intellectual comfort zone. The miracles disturb you. You can't figure out if they're a stumbling block to your belief or if they're the cornerstone of your faith. And I think this is by design. Miracles are unique. They're significant events that confront us with evidence that the natural world is not all that is out there. Supernatural events are a signal that there's more going on in this world than the eye can see. They're unbelievable, yet designed to incite belief. The miracles are evidence of existence of a higher being. They defy human explanation. They point to the Savior. They signal to us that Jesus is worthy of our attention. Some might say they don't believe in miracles because they believe in science. It is as if to say that to believe in science is to believe that miracles are impossible. So are science and belief in the supernatural in conflict? Well, science assumes order and consistency in the natural world. Science attempts to explain the world through forming hypotheses and then testing them through repetition in a closed environment. The problem with miracles is that they cannot be tested through repetition. And they're influenced by a power outside of the natural world. In fact, miracles make the opposite assumption, that the world is not a controlled environment, that there is a higher hand intervening in the natural world. So I don't think you have to believe in one at the expense of the other as much as you have to acknowledge that faith and science are looking at the same world based on different assumptions or perspectives. Well, let's take a look at our first miracle in the Gospel of John, the turning of the water to wine. This is the first of seven signs that John will record in his Gospel, and it occurred at a village called Cana at a wedding event. Look at John chapter 2, verse 1. Let's pick up the story. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. This event occurred three days after the calling of Philip and Nathaniel to be Christ's disciples. And the wedding took place at a little village where archaeologists don't even know where it's at exactly today. It hasn't been discovered, but it's believed to be located near Nazareth, Christ's hometown. And we can assume that's why the family was invited, that Jesus' family was invited because they're familiar with this family. They're friends of the family throwing the wedding party. In fact, in the story, we'll see the mother of Jesus, Mary, be very concerned to ensure that this wedding was a beautiful success. Now, in the Bible context, these weddings were marathon celebrations, often lasting up to seven full days. And this is a, a special occasion for the family, just as it, is, as it is for us today. It required a lot of planning, and it served a lot of people, and it took a lot of food, and as we'll see today, wine. And at this wedding, Jesus performed his first miracle. And this story we're going to see today is only found in the Gospel of John. It's unique material to John. It's not included in the synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. 
Verse three raises the concern of the potential wedding blunder or mishap. It says, when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Verse three reveals the potential blunder. They ran out of wine. And this would have not been good. Bible commentator uh, Eugene or Merrill Tenney describes running out of wine as a potential social disaster. It would have been an insult to those present, in the, uh, a shaming of the bridegroom. He would have been embarrassed. He would have been dishonored, could have even been shunned in his society because the food and the wine was essential to the seven-day celebration. Let me offer a parallel from our culture. Imagine you've been invited to attend a wedding. You've traveled 15 miles out into Tawny Town to go to a barn. <laughs> That's what we do. You bought the couple a nice gift and you RSVP'd for a sit-down dinner. You were assigned to a table which had your name on a place card. You could smell the food and you were hungry because the preacher went long. You look on your table and there's a menu there. It says on it, pecan-crusted salmon with gnocchi with a gargonzola cream sauce. Your taste buds begin to burst into flame. As you observe other guests at other tables, they're eating their food, but as you look around, a third of the tables have received none. You begin to wait patiently, but look longingly at the other people's salmon. Eventually, someone from the wedding party comes with an apology. They say they're sorry, but they've run out of food. How would you feel? How do you think the bride and the groom would feel? And would you have snuck out and run through Arby's? <laughs> and would you have gossiped about it the next week? Did you hear about the Smith wedding? Ran out of salmon. <laughs> I didn't even get a morsel. I bet they kept that gift though. <laughs> Probably using that Keurig right now. That's what is potentially to happen here. And in an attempt to avert the shaming of this family, the mother of Jesus intervened. She came to the aid of the bride and the groom. There was still time to save face. So she went to Jesus and she said, they have no more wine, implying that she was appealing to him to help, asking him for divine intervention. Jesus replied to his mother's request, woman, why do you involve me? Now we need to talk about this. For the English reader, this doesn't seem like an advisable response. <laughs> it seems aloof and a bit harsh for Mother's Day, wouldn't you think? Now, don't interpret the use of that word woman as being abrupt. It's actually just a formal term. It would be as though he's saying madam or ma'am. It's the same term that Jesus uses in John 19, verse 26, when he's on the cross. And he's ensuring the care of his mother after his death, he looks at his disciple John and says, woman, behold your son. Now, this is a term that was, I think, appropriate and intentional. Mary engaged Jesus about his ministry. She was getting into his business, his professional life. So in using this term, Jesus is using the formal over the intimate family term to talk business. And there are times in the Bible when Jesus clearly puts his family second and the cause of his mission and his calling first. But I do see here a hint of correction. He's not just being formal here. This interaction has a little bit of a, a bite to it. In the original language, that phrase, why do you involve me, reads, what is it to me and you? Jesus explained that this would be overstepping the responsibility or social expectations that he has in relation to this family. And also, and more importantly, the request was prematurely initiating his messianic timeline. He said, my hour has not come. Jesus was sent by the Father to save the world from its sin. This plan would involve revealing himself as the Messiah at some point, but this was not the intended time for that revelation to happen. This theme of my hour or my time runs throughout the gospel of John. And it's a, re a reference to the redemptive work of Jesus on the cross. Five times in the book, he would say, my time has not come. My hour has not come. But then he turns the corner 
He's headed towards the cross and he begins to say, he says three times, my hour has come. Maybe he didn't desire that his coming out to the world as one possessing divine power would be, would be associated with saving a wedding from running out of wine. Maybe it was the wrong time, but also maybe the wrong need or the wrong place or the wrong crowd even. Jesus seemed more concerned with the Father's timeline for revealing his glory than the wedding party's food crisis or his mother's concern for her friends. So how did Mary respond to Jesus' reluctance? In class of mom form, she said, I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> Despite Christ's attempt to refuse or redirect, Mary persisted. She said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. And that's such a mom move. Mary exerted executive privilege. She overruled. If there's one thing I've learned in life is don't mess with mom. Peaceful compliance is highly recommended. Now, before we are too hard on Mary, it may not as be as bad as it seems. Mary both persists and submits at the same time. What did she actually say? Do whatever he tells you. She put Jesus in the driver's seat. She continued her advocacy, but she yielded to his authority. And check this out. This is regarded to be the only suggestion or instruction given by the mother of Jesus in the whole Bible and is also the last recorded words of Mary. So on Mother's Day, let's let Mary preach. Do whatever he tells you. Put that on a meme. If you did nothing else in life but listen to the words of the mother of Jesus, do whatever Jesus tells you. Would that work out? That'll preach. Let's drop the mic, go to brunch. <laughs> no, let's finish the story. Despite his reluctance, like a good son, and offering a lesson to us all, Jesus honors his mother and does what she asks. Look at verse six. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. And they did so. The story emphasizes the scale of this miracle. Jesus was working with 120 to 180 gallons of liquid. This not only testified to the power of God, but also the grace of God. This amount of wine would have more than covered the need for the family. If an average glass of wine is six ounces, then Jesus provided them with over 3,000 servings. Plenty to last several days for a large party. And note that the miracle used the water from the ceremonial jars. These would have been used for purification rites before and after meals, which would have been required for those who wanted to remain clean before the Lord. So the servants drew a portion. They took the vessel to the master of the banquet and look what unfolded in verse nine. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned to wine he did not realize where it had come from, though the servants knew who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best till now. The master of the banquet, he was charged with guiding the celebration, but also with quality control. So his role was to taste the wine and to approve. And by the time it reached him, the water had been turned to wine. The text treats the miracle with subtle detail. But by his word, Jesus transformed the ceremonial water into over 750 bottles of wine, 150 gallons. I think the miracle is found in the time and the place because water turns to wine very naturally. The rains come down and water the vineyard. In the process of bearing fruit and then in the process of fermentation, it becomes wine. Water to wine is normal and natural, but it takes months. It takes even years. And it takes a vineyard. Jesus sped up the process and he left the vine and the grape out, which reminds me of our I am statement from last week. Does anybody remember it? I am the true what? Boom. While this miracle had public repercussions, it was a private display. The only people who knew that it had occurred were Jesus, his mother, the disciples, and the servants. And he produced a lot of wine, and it was good wine. 
fine wine, the kind you can't buy at a gas station or at the dollar store. And the master of the banquet, who was also the on-site sommelier, said so. He regarded it as better than any that had been served thus far. It, it seems that the custom of the day was to begin with the good stuff and then move to the lesser quality. Perhaps over the life of the party, the wine would dull the, or numb the guest discernment. The custom was to begin with the bottles that had corks and then move to the screw tops and close out with the box stuff. <laughs> and he noted that Christ's wine was better. I think this is significant. I think this whole miracle has much significance and symbolism wrapped up in it because later Jesus would lift a cup of wine and he would say that this cup is the blood of the new covenant. He was previewing a new way for sinners to come clean before a holy God. And it would not be through the ceremonial washing or the sacrificial system or obedience to the Mosaic law. It would be by his blood. And in his first miracle, Jesus made a statement that his way was better than the old. The way of the son is superior to what was before. Look at verse 11. It closes out the story. It records the reaction to the miracle. It said, what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory. And his disciples believed in him. John, as he repeatedly will do in his gospel, shows us people's reaction to the miracle. He reveals the results of the miracle. He records how the miracle advanced the mission and how it brought transformation. Jesus was glorified. He was revealed in his glory at Cana. And it produced belief. When he changed water to wine, he not only revealed his glory, but he showed grace to this family in need. He showed who he truly was. The miracle pulled back the curtain and allowed the true identity of Christ to be shown. And the disciples believed. This event bolstered their newfound or even emerging faith, which, by the way, is the primary purpose of the Gospel of John. Let me remind you, it says at the end of the gospel, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written, he records seven miracles, that you may what? Believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you might find life in his name. John wrote this gospel to persuade us to believe in Jesus and to receive eternal life. I think you could sum up the story this way, that the miracles of Jesus reveal his glory and they cultivate belief. The glory of God is revealed in the miracles of Christ. These signs and wonders allow us a glimpse of his deity. These miracles are designed to incite within us awe and wonder and amazement and fear that comes when we see the supernatural power of God reverse the curse of the fall in this world. And I want to warn you to be careful as we study these miracles. You've probably heard before that Jesus turned water to wine. Yes? Don't let the familiarity of the story lessen or diminish the awe and wonder they're designed to produce. We need to hold on to the shock value of what happened in Cana because that man that changed that water to wine is your God. And he's your savior. In the miracle, we see that he's divine. We see that he is able. We see that he's worthy. And we see that he cares. He cares about the mundane things in your life. Like your celebrations. Or your mom's friends. Ultimately, this miracle is designed to cultivate your faith. To deepen and affirm and bolster your belief in Christ. More than changing water to wine, Jesus wants to change hearts and souls. Would you pray with me? Well, Father, may we not move past this miracle today, a familiar story, without letting it deeply affect our souls. Father, I pray that we would sit in awe and wonder and amazement of who you are. Omnipotent, yet you care for our everyday needs. And Father, I pray that if there's someone here who's just been wrestling with who you are, that they would see that you're not just a prophet 
or a teacher or a good person, but that you're the Messiah who came to save their soul through the cross. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the opportunity we have to see you clearly today. So, Father, would you guide us as we worship you? It's in Jesus' name, amen.